Hello, I'd like to talk about two key concepts that are useful when thinking about auctions. The first key concept is the Coase theorem. Now consider the electromagnetic spectrum. You've got low frequency at one end, rising up to high frequency at the other. Things like radio stations are going to occupy the low frequency range of the bandwidth. Moving slightly higher frequency, you've got things like 3G and Wi-Fi, and higher still, you've got satellites. Now in particular, let's look at the radio spectrum, and you've got various different bandwidths. You've got AM, you've got FM, and you've got all of these different bandwidths and different radio stations that are broadcasting at different parts of this bandwidth. Now historically, the problem was interference, which is different radio stations sending signals that are too similar to each other, such that none of those signals are being sent clearly. Now in a very famous 1959 paper, the economist Ronald Coase proposed a solution. He argued that the interference was due to a lack of property rights. And so his solution was something that many economists have proposed ever since for things that are a commons. And that is to establish some property rights. What Coase argued was that first of all, policymakers should define the frequency. In other words, establish a right to submit a bandwidth at a particular frequency. You should then allow people to have the exclusive use to broadcast at that frequency. And the way that you allow people to have the exclusive use is by issuing a license. The critical issue then comes down to who gets those licenses. And Coase's main point was that we can let the market decide who obtains those licenses. He argued that it doesn't matter so much who you initially give those licenses to, as long as there's a market process that determines the rearrangement. This formed the basis of what became known as the Coase theorem. The Coase theorem says that if transaction costs are low, in other words, if it's use easy to use the market mechanism, then the final allocation of rights is the same regardless of initial endowments. So in other words, it doesn't matter who we give the licenses to in the first place, the final allocation of licenses will be the same regardless. What this means is that the licenses we should expect to end up with the people who value them the most. And provided those licenses are given out in the first place, the market can solve this problem. An additional advantage of Coase's solution was that in doing so, we can actually discover the optimal amount of interference. This market process is a way of not only solving the commons problem, but also generating and discovering new knowledge. Now, the second key concept that's relevant for thinking about auctions is the transitional gains trap. Back in the 1930s, the public had concerns over the mechanical integrity, i.e. the quality, of taxis. And we're going to look at a particular taxi market, which is the taxis in New York City. So New York City gave out licenses to protect consumers. These licenses were known as medallions, and the medallions gave the owner of the medallion the right to accept a street hail. So although there's lots of different taxis in New York, the owners of the medallions are the only ones that are able to accept a street hail. They're allowed to accept passengers without a prior booking. If you think about the London taxi market, there's lots of different taxis in London, but it's only black cabs that you're able to get without a booking. Now, initially, as I said, these medallions were given out to protect consumers. It was to enable consumers to feel confident that if they got into a taxi with a medallion, they got into one of these yellow cabs, then it would function appropriately. And people knew that if there was any problems with that medallion holder, then they could have the medallion removed. The medallions came into being in 1937. And originally, just under 12,000 medallions were issued. They weren't handed out for free. There was a token charge of $10 per medallion, which is approximately $175 in 2018. Now this system was largely unchanged until 1996. We should expect that since 1937, the demand for taxi journeys would have risen substantially. But if the supply of taxis has been reasonably stable, that implies that prices must have gone up. And if prices have gone up, then the value of a medallion would rise as well. By 2004, there were still just under 12,000 medallions but they were now changing hands for a lot more than $10 each. At medallion auctions in 2004, 
we saw some medallions changing hands for $280,000. Now there were a few new medallions that were handed out during this period. In 2006, an additional 300 medallions were distributed for hybrids and wheelchair access cabs. But by 2007, there were still just over 13,000 medallions in operation and they were changing hands for around $309,000. In 2008, medallions were selling for just under $550,000 and 2013 was the first year where a medallion sold for $1 million. Now have a think about what's going on here. The taxi industry has very low costs of entry, but due to these licenses, it has very high barriers to entry. And high entry barriers mean that the producers are going to be better off at the expense of consumers. Now, the consumers are worse off to the extent to which they have to pay slightly higher fares than they would do under competition. And there's obviously lots of consumers in New York. But we would normally expect that if we have a small group of concentrated benefits, then they're going to have more ability to influence the political process than having a large group of dispersed costs. In other words, the 13,000 people with a million dollar asset are going to be more politically mobile than the 8.6 million people who have slightly higher fares as a result. Now, one thing to point out is that the million dollar medallion was a corporate medallion, which means that the person who paid for this medallion did not have to drive the taxi to which the medallion was attached. Note that some of the medallions are owner-occupied ones, which means that the owner of the, of the medallion is the only person that's able to drive the taxi. Those do sell for less, but the general point is an important one. We have a situation now with interest groups that are devoted to preventing competition from taking place at the expense of consumers. But the interesting question is who benefits from the medallions? It's not the current medallion owners, because they're only going to earn normal profits. Actually, what they're earning is probably not best considered to be a profit, given that profits are rewards for wealth creation. They're actually earning rents, where a rent is a non-market return over the cost of production. The people who gain from the system are therefore the original owners of the medallions, those people who bought a medallion at a below market price and then were able to sell the medallion subsequently for above market prices. The important thing to realise is that those original owners have already made their gains, so those gains were only transitional. This is why we refer to it as transitional gains. But since the current licence holders will still have an incentive to lobby up to the value of the expected capital loss to prevent competition from taking place, it's considered a trap hence the transitional gains trap. Now an interesting thing is to think about what might help us overcome the transitional gains trap. And in many cases, it's going to be new technology. In the case of the taxi industry, we can think of the major technological innovation, um, which is the introduction of lift sharing services such as Uber. Now Uber's entry is very interesting because they're not competing with the yellow cabs or the medallion owners in terms of the medallion owners specific licensed ability to operate a monopoly. As I said, the medallion gives the owner the right to accept a street hail. And there's already a taxi industry where you need to have a booking in order to be able to make a journey. The Uber business model still requires their passengers to make a booking. It's just that their app has made that booking process so simple, it becomes a very close substitute to a street hail. And we can see that the rise of Uber has meant that there's been a major impact on the value of those medallions, given that the source of competition is so much stronger. Indeed, in 2016, with still just over 13,000 medallions in existence, the price had actually fallen to $500,000. So we can see that the introduction of Uber has had a massive impact on the value of having a medallion and therefore on the taxi industry as a whole. Now, in lots of cities, taxi cartels have been able to prevent Uber from entering the marketplace and competing with them. In some cases, we can say that Uber is actually a very good metric to see how open to competition a city is. So to summarise, we can say that the Coase theorem tells us that the way that we can solve commons problems is by giving out licenses.
And the Coase theorem goes even further than that to say it doesn't actually matter who we give those licenses to. The market process will ensure that the licenses move to their highest valued use. The problem that we've seen with the transitional gains trap is that those licenses generate interest groups and those interest groups have an incentive to prevent competition from taking place. So those licenses can serve as a barrier to entry and can restrict competition. A really interesting exercise is to look at some famous examples of auctions such as the 3G telecom license auction and to understand the extent to which those two concepts, the Coase theorem and the transitional gains trap, apply.